right. It's kind of weird that um, it was less than a year ago that we were reviewing the Wolverine. Yeah. That was the end of July. Uh, so that movie ended with, uh, if anybody saw the post credits scene, I'm sure you have by now, when um, Wolverine is walking through the airport and there's Magneto and Xavier and he says um, they're together and they say we've got you know, an issue and it cuts to black. And that issue is the fact that um, Peter Dinklage's company Trask Industries, which we actually saw teased in the airport. I don't know why airports are uh, advertising weapons industries, but yeah. anyway, <laughs> um, it's just, it was just to throw in the Acer right. But um, Peter Dinklage's just company has created what is apparent was apparently a big deal in the comics, the Sentinels. Mm -hmm. because oh yeah, I remember it being a huge deal when um, it was put out there that they were going to be in this one. Especially the animated series. Um, it's worth noting before this review goes any further that I haven't picked up an X-Men comic in my life. The only thing I know is what I've heard and what's in the other movies. You didn't watch the cartoon series? Bye. No, I haven't. Really? <laughs> That's how I know the existence of how awesome the Sentinels can truly be as villains. And granted, they're just they're robots, but still. <laughs> and what's happened is we are in a Matrix-esque future. And the Sentinels have basically destroyed everything, and there's this war happening. So, uh, and this is because Mystique assassinated Peter Dinklage. Yep. Uh, I could just be calling him Trask, it's much faster, but <laughs> his name is fun to say. <laughs> the Dink um, is good? Yes. So, um, the plan is that, um, I was... And I was curious about the fact that this was a uh, time travel movie because mm -hmm. I was like, okay, uh, what does a time machine look like in the X-Men universe without looking ridiculous? Uh, it's actually not quite that. Um, Kitty Pride apparently has the ability to... Um, we start with a, um, a mutant named Bishop who is Omar Sy from The Intouchables. Yes. <laughs> and she can send... Not so much send you back in time, but send your present mind back to your younger self. Yes. Which is basically another way for you to time travel. Mm -hmm. um, so they realize they need to go back in time and stop Mystique from assassinating Trask so the war doesn't break out. Um, and basically destroy the world. Um, but to do that, they need somebody who is indestructible because basically she, because she says, you know, she's used to going back like minutes in time or like an hour in time, uh, going back decades would basically uh, rip somebody apart, literally. Um, so Wolverine chimes in and says, well, I can heal myself, so I'll do it. <laughs> um, and they send Wolverine back to work with. Young Xavier, played by McAvoy, and Young Magneto, played by Fassbender, who we got to know in X-Men First Class. Yes. Um, I know what you're thinking. This is the plot to Men in Black 3. Yeah, it is. But, um, <laughs> similarity stop here, I promise. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so, um, there is another... There's actually a lot of plots going on here, but the interesting thing that the movie does well is um, they manage to bring all these things together into one story without piling on too much, which is something superhero movies have gotten a lot of complaints for lately. Yeah. Um, but everything kind of ties together with how it has to fit into what's going on in the story at this particular time. Uh, the first obstacle is to... Um, well, technically, the first obstacle is to convince young Xavier that Wolverine is from the future. <laughs> um, and secondly, they have to break Eric out of prison. Because he is responsible for the uh, assassination of JFK, which explains the magic bullet. Yeah. Um, and in an ingenious twist, um, they have decided to keep Magneto in a completely impenetrable prison. He is in a cell buried underneath the Pentagon. <laughs> so absolutely nothing can get to him. 
Um, and that's when we're in, we're introduced to a new character, which is Quicksilver. Yes. Who, yeah, is kind of the Marvel universe is kind of splitting up a little bit. To my understanding, uh, they're just one is kind of ignoring the other, as far as the Avengers, Quicksilver, and this one. Well, they're both in Kickass. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, Evan Peters is uh, Quicksilver. Who most of you probably know from American Horror Story before Kick-Ass, because he was replaced in Kick-Ass too. But anyway, um, and Nicholas Holt comes back as young uh, Hank and Beast. And basically, um, I think I want to go in. One of the things I was wondering about was what I had heard was the reason there is a time travel subplot is not subplot, Jesus. Um, there's a time travel plot is because Singer wanted to fix inconsistencies in the series. That's exactly right. Because if you go back and look at this series, it's all fucked up. <laughs> yeah. And you just did recently, so. Yeah. So, um, because normally everybody was under the assumption that he was going to write off, uh, X-Men 3 and Origins and just go with, uh, 1, 2 and the Wolverine. Um, but he's actually stayed, you know true to the whole series. He said, you know, even if, you know, Origins and X-Men 3 kind of fucked up in places, they're all part of the canon. That's gonna make, he's gonna make sure to, um, uh, throw first class into the ones he's using too, by the way. Um, I only slept for three hours last night. Please bear with me. <laughs> um, so, Yes, the the in, really ingenious thing that this movie does is manages to do all of this, bringing in the old characters with the new characters, and bringing in there's there's a whole problem involving um, Xavier can walk, but for a while we're not sure how or why, and that's kind of goes in with um, when we see Hank for the first time in the movie, he looks normal, which is curious. Mm -hmm. But that's because he has developed a serum where he can control his power, or his turning into beast. But at the same time, uh, he can give it to Xavier. But the problem is, when Xavier has the serum and can walk, um, he doesn't have his powers. One cancels the other out when they are working. So, um, and then there's the whole problem with, um, sometimes, they don't use this as much as they could have. They only used it really once, but, um, if Wolverine gets too shaken while he's in the past, uh, he can get confused as to where he is in time. Like, there was a point in time where he's in the 70s, but then he has a flashback to uh, when he, the adamantium was being put in him, and he forgets where he is. May I ask if he was on an acid trip? Yes, yeah, Xavier uh, convinces him that he's okay because they just gave him bad ass. <laughs> because it is 73. Yes. Um... Another concern that I had with this movie at first, um, before I say anything, uh, this movie is fantastic. Yeah, it is. And I loved almost everything about it. Uh, now I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> uh, one of my first big concerns was I thought it might have been too soon for a movie like this. Yeah. I because we had three movies, the first three movies, and then we had... Um, Origins, which basically kind of brought back those characters, only their younger selves. And then we had um, the Wolverine, which was the continuation. Uh, we only had one first class where they're young. And this felt more like, at the time, before I saw it, uh, this felt more like a movie that needed a lot more build-up. Like maybe one or two more movies of the ca with the cast from first class before yeah. we combine the cast. I can see that. Um, At least I'm service. But uh, it's actually really well put together. Like the, um, in, you'll notice in first class that um, it's kind of hard to believe that the characters played by James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender would have become the characters played by Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. Mm -hmm. But there is a point in time in the middle of this movie where you can start to really see the um, transformation, how they became those characters. In the first one, I didn't really get that much at all. But in this one, there are scenes where McAvoy really channels Stewart, and there are scenes where Fassman really channels McEllen. Yeah. And it kind of makes this seamless 
passage into the current state of things. Um, another concern was basically the same thing. It was just going to be a fill in the blanks movie, kind of like Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. But um, everything. What another great thing is um, the way they managed to use all these characters, also because like the way they develop through the story because you have so many you have to work with um one of the main points in the story is the relationship between um xavier and eric and how obviously when we saw them in first class uh eric was the reason that xavier is crippled and then he went on to become magneto and did a bunch of evil so xavier doesn't really like him anymore <laughs> And that's a feud throughout the movie when they have to team back up for this. Which, of course, turns right back into Eric going evil again. Yeah. Because uh, that's just the way he works. And all, even in the um, in the later movies when Ian McKellen was doing it, he just had this way of, I think I'm good now, but no, I'm going straight back to bed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and you never... Uh, one of these days they're going to learn that you just cannot lock Magneto up. <laughs> yeah, no lie. He's going to get out every time. <laughs> Whether it be taking the iron out of some guard's blood, or being supposedly helped to the uh, heroes of the story. <laughs> um, we also managed to get a lot of great performances out of it. Like, um, I would say, um, I've actually heard a complaint that a lot of people are sick of Wolverine now. Not like the hardcore fans, but a lot of people that I've talked to that just, like me, just really know the movies and nothing mm -hmm. else. Um, with the whole Hugh Jackman pretty much said he was done after this, but then lo and behold, he and Mangold are going to do another movie after this, <laughs> um, supposedly. Now he's changed his mind several times. Um, so who knows how long we're going to have Wolverine, but I think as long as he, you know, stays true to the character, which even he admitted that Origins went a little off the path that he was hoping for. Um... Because when they made Origins, he was supposed to like go back to his badass roots because he thought he'd softened up too much in uh, The Last Stand. Uh, a way you can tell they really fucked up is uh, Wolverine seems a lot more hardcore in The Last Stand than he does in Origins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, he's such a solid actor and he still has that consistency that, you know, as long as he wants to play Wolverine, I'm okay with it. I think the best performance in the movie is McAvoy's. Mm -hmm. Um... Because he's just got... Well, first of all, he's James McAvoy. He's always great. Uh, and never really gets the appreciation. He has, like, one Golden Globe nomination for Atonement, but and that's all the recognition he's gotten. Um, and, of course, Fastbender, but... Fa I mean, Fastbender is great. Because, he, once again, because he's consistently... That, that's the trick to this movie, is that all the actors in it are consistent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can throw Dinklage in there, too. Um... But I think McAvoy kind of went above and beyond the rest of the cast in this. And obviously Lawrence is good also. Her uh, rabid fans are screaming at me right now wondering why I'm not raving her to the very end. <laughs> but um, They must be new pop viewers. <laughs> yes. Everybody's great, but I thought McAvoy was above them. But of course, you know, he had a lot to work with. Ellen Page did a great job too. Yeah, that's, a, um, I don't know how much of this is going to be an issue to people, um, obviously the big thing, the whole reason this movie exists is to combine the two casts, mm -hmm. to make this big, epic, you know, thing. Um, we really don't get a lot of the old cast, mm -hmm. and some, some of them don't even come back. Um, we can go more into that in the other video, but, we will um, tomorrow. Our main focus is, um, on the other side in the future, we have, um, Xavier and Magneto as Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. Uh, flip that. <laughs> and, um, Halle Berry is back as Storm, which is interesting because I think nobody really knew if she was supposed to be in the movie or not, because mm -hmm. I had heard a while back that she got cut. But that was just a rumor, I guess, obviously. Um, so, and you have some of the, a lot of them from The Last Stand. Um, and Bobby is back, obviously. Um, and you basically have them fighting in the future while you have the first class cast plus Wolverine fighting in the uh, past. Um, and there's a great scene at the end where this all happens at the same time. And 
once again, it's kind of it's very matrixy in that aspect, where you have the two simultaneous action scenes in the two separate in the two separate worlds, more or less. Um, as far as the 3D is concerned, to be totally honest, I didn't know we were watching in 3D until we got there. But um, it's really, I don't know if it's just the, the superhero movies seem to really be working with it lately. I don't know if it's just we've been watching the good ones lately mm -hmm. or if 3D has actually improved that much. It, I still don't think it makes a difference. If you watch it in 2D, I don't think it would like be any different than if you watched it this way. But um, it still looks really good, especially the scenes like you have the DNA opening and then you have the... Um, the scenes with Sir, what he uses Cerebro. Uh, Quicksilver. Really good with it. Time yeah, there's a, there's a great scene with Quicksilver where they have to, um, when they're breaking out of the, they're going through the kitchen in the Pentagon when they're breaking Eric out. And it's one of those things where, he, since he moves, obviously, so quickly, we do the thing where everything stops while he moves. And it's this fantastic, great scene. It's the Jim Croce's time in a bottle when it's awesome. <laughs> Every single way possible. Um, as far as the rest of the series, um, I think this is easily the best one they've made. Oh, yeah. But the problem with me is, is I never really got as into the, I mean, I think they're fine, but I've never been as much of a, uh, fan of the X-Men movies as other superhero movies. Um, like, my favorite one of the last, of the whole bunch before this one was First Class, and I liked it just a little bit better than the original movie, the first one I made. Uh, because, give me all your down votes, please, I don't care. X2 is probably one of the most overrated movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Click. For the love of God. <laughs> so uh, many clicks going around right now, I can just hear them in my head. So, and that was the problem, was this is getting really, really stellar reviews. And it deserves it, too. And I was worried immediately, because I was like, oh shit, it's X2 again. <laughs> um, but no, this is easily, easily, far and away, the best one they've made. I'm not even sure how they're going to top it with Apocalypse, but we'll see what happens. Uh, that is two years from now. So... And 3D will be more advanced two years from now, too. Think about that ways, too. Or they'll give up on it. Either one's fine. It's going to die eventually, but we just don't know exactly when. So, um, yes. Ten so ums later. Uh, that's pretty much how I feel about Days of Future Past. We'll get into the rest of it in the other video. Yeah, we'll do a spoiler alert tomorrow, just like we do in most uh, superhero movies. So, yeah, that'll be our next one. That'll be tomorrow's video. But we're not done yet. We still have a lot of interesting things to talk about. Yes, we have four to go. Oh, uh, before I forget, um, not that anybody gives a fuck. I doubt zero, but um, <laughs> I mentioned in the last video I was going to do the Lunchbox this week, but I got mixed up on its release date, so it's actually coming in about a month. I said, I don't think anybody gave a fuck, but I'll throw that out there anyway, in case there was that one person that was like, oh, the Lunchbox is next week? Awesome, I'm in. Um, sorry, dude. <laughs> we sorry. waited forever for the immigrant, and we finally got it out last week, so. Okay. Um, our next movie is Adam Sandler's new outing. Oh, dear God. Sure, you're all excited for. Uh, Blended. Which is originally called The Family Moon. Either way, they've said the title a lot. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing they go to in Africa is called The Blended Family Moon or something. So it was going to be one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just go into it. Um, this is a reunion, a long-awaited <laughs> reunion of Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore because the last two movies they did in that awful Versus video I did, <laughs> uh, because I was tired and gave up on it halfway <laughs> through. I don't know if you We need to do a reprise of that eventually. <laughs> but... Um, this is their reunion after The Wedding Singer and Fifty First Dates, which were both really good. Yes. Uh, much better than what Sandler's been doing lately. Even um, he himself is saying that nowadays. Yeah, his last quite a few movies have just basically been paid vacations for him. With his friends. <laughs> because in Just Go With It, they went to Hawaii. I believe so. Something tropical. I think uh, it was Hawaii. In Jack and Jill, they went on a cruise. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, where do they go in Grown Ups 2? In Grown Ups 2, they just fucking hang out. Um, here they go to Africa. I'm sure there's more movies where he goes places that I've already forgotten. Really makes me want to go to the Animal Kingdom Logic so bad. So, uh, yeah, I was having Disney World flashbacks. I haven't been there since <laughs> second grade, but I was really... <laughs> totally reminds me of Animal Kingdom Logic. Okay, so, um, we begin and we start at a Hooters. Because, don't get me wrong, Hooters food is delicious. Yes, it is. Um... <laughs> Fuck the reason, real reason people go there. I like the fucking food. Their I, fries are amazing. I don't care. Fuck you. <laughs> um, and, of course, actually we start in the bathroom at Hooters. This is where this movie's standards are at. <laughs> Gives you a sign of things to come. Uh, Drew Barrymore's freaking out because she's on a first date with Sandler's character and he took her to Hooters. Uh, which has some emotional significance later, but fuck that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. <laughs> Hooters has emotional significance. Oh my gosh. So anyway, um, she comes out of the bathroom, and he, I think all this is in the trailer. Um, yeah. He drank her beer while she was in the bathroom, and then hilarity ensues, and we have gross-out gags, where he gives her mushroom soup because she ate something that was too hot. French onion soup. She spits it all over him. <laughs> Sandler hijinks ensue. And immediately, we start with one of the Cardinal Sandler sins. He's making me spit. One of the first uh, Cardinal Sandler sins lately, which is he sure does love to cast himself as a ladies' man. Yeah. And while he's not married to Selma Hayek or Katie Holmes in this movie, um, he is sought after by not one, but four Hooters waitresses. All totally in love with him. <laughs> yep. And they're all names that begin with B. So anyway, um, and they bring in mozzarella sticks in the shapes of hearts. Because they love him so much. Love his tips. But anyway, not when you're Adam Sandler in a movie written by Adam Sandler. Good point. <laughs> so, I don't even think he got a writing credit, but you know he's pretty much... Jack Garaputo probably got the writing credit. <laughs> he's pretty much over the shoulders of all the writers, so... Like, this has writers. Why he's counting his money. So, um, obviously, we get the big setup. Okay, this is one of those unlikable Sandler douchebags who does have, you know, a heart in there somewhere under all his, you know, frat boy hijinks. And, good God, do they not waste time manipulating... Manip manipul... God damn it! Manipulating. Manipulating you <laughs> immediately. Because... Three hours, folks. <laughs> Fuck off. So, anyway... <laughs> Um, they're talking about their exes. He was married to a woman we never see. She was married to Joel McHale, um, who was a stereotypical douchebag. And she's like, oh, I'll bet your wife, you know, was just, you know, in love with all this. And she's like, why did she leave you? And <laughs> we're five minutes into this movie. She asks him why his wife left him. Dead. Dead, serious. Dead series. Cancer. <laughs> Five minutes in, they're throwing this shit at us already. <laughs> and now, basically what that means in a movie Sandler does is, this guy can now be the sleaziest fuck of all time, but all his sins are forgiven because his wife died of cancer. That's what the movie tells us in the first five minutes. <laughs> And naturally, we get to meet her side, which is Joel McHale. And Joel McHale is the neglectful dad that has no time and doesn't show up for the baseball games. He's Peter Banning is what he is. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if he actually did the thing where he sends a guy from his office to record the game for him. <laughs> like that. Um, and every time the kid wants to do something, uh, something comes up and he leaves. Um, I think this is played for comedy while also trying to say this guy's a douchebag and he's going to be a douchebag later. Well thought out characters here. Yeah. It's a Sandler movie though. Um, now let's talk about a couple of the, uh, okay, well first off, uh, I'll finish the plot here. Because it gets, it takes a long time. This movie is two hours. This movie is two goddamn hours. It's way too long. Um, about a half an hour in, in, we finally realize we've been building up and building up. Oh my god, they hate each other. Oh my god, they keep running into each other. We know they're going to end up together, but oh my god, they hate each other so much. 
So, it turns out that we have this other plot with Drew Barrymore's best friend. And for God's sake, I haven't hated a character in a movie like this in a long time. Um, but she's one of the... Okay, this is one of those movies that shows us women who basically... Women only exist on Earth to talk about two things. The men in their life and clothes. This is how open-minded the writers of this are. <laughs> um, and there's this little joke that happens twice where they're mistaken for lesbians. <laughs> so, and there's this, they keep calling love the L word and, you know, the L word. <laughs> lesbians. Anyway, um, she is with this unseen character for a while named Dick, who just happens to be the dick of the Dick's sporting goods store. F. Uh, which Sandler works for, you know, for product placement. He works there with Shaq, because just Shaq's presence is supposed to be funny. When did every black guy in the world start to look like, um, Rick Ross? Because Mark Henry does it, and now Shaq in this movie does it. They both have the Rick Ross beard. It's crazy. So, um, Dick was going to propose to Drew Barrymore's best friend, but she dumped him because he has kids. This is supposed to be funny, I think. It's supposed I to be. I don't know. Uh, half the time I wasn't even sure what was supposed to be funny or not. But anyway, um, so Drew Barrymore gets the idea and she says, well, why don't you give me the trip to Africa that he was going to go on now that you've canceled it? But Sandler, you know, wanting to take it away from her, calls him up because it's the same guy. Um, and says that he wants it. And, of course, they end up in the same place and do the, oh my god, what are you doing here? thing. And then Adam Sandler goes on vacation on camera for about an hour and a half. Uh, okay. Um, and you get all the Sandler things you would expect. If you wanted to see Adam Sandler go shopping for tampons, this is the movie for you. If you want to see two rhinos humping, this is also the movie for you. Um, if you want to see the same jokes told over and over and over again, this this movie that is two hours long probably had five jokes in it that they just kept using over and over again. Like, um, they overused the joke where the kid is referred to as Frodo. It's in the I don't know how you can use that joke more than once, but they found a way. Um, Sandler has two daughters, well he has three daughters, but two of them are tomboys. And basically the only reason these characters exist are for jokes that they're mistaken for boys. That is the only reason these characters exist. Not even doing the fact that, of course, the one that we keep focusing on. By the way, her name is Hillary, and he calls her Larry. Yep. Like, that's not supposed to be helping. But anyway, you know. His other daughter's name is Espen. Because of ESPN. ESPN. Oh, fuck that. So anyway, um, and of course, you know, she's a tomboy, and that's played up that she's always mistaken for boys constantly. That is the whole joke of her character. That they just keep doing over and over and over again. I was so very, very shocked when they had a scene where they beautify her and she walks into a room in slow motion. Totally caught me off guard. I did not see that shit coming. At all. The first second they showed her character, I didn't see that scene coming at all. Um, there is a really, really, really creepy character in this movie. One of the creepiest characters I've seen in a long time. It's Drew Barrymore's oldest kid. The kid that keeps getting mistaken for Frodo. Um, now, generally in movies, when you have the single mother, um, usually there's a character where they have a son that's overprotective of them. Uh, this movie takes this to a really, really disturbing level. Her, I, once again, I think it's supposed to be funny, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, this kid is like... 
11 or 12, if that. And basically treats Sandler like... The kid acts like a jealous lover of Drew Barrymore's. When he's her 12-year-old son. And there's a joke through the whole movie where he keeps calling her hot. And everybody looks at him strange. I guess the joke they were going for here is the creepy... Um, incestuous crush thing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and apparently it's returned because another creepy factor of him is they have a babysitter and he takes uh, the centerfolds of dirty magazines and he, he uh, cuts out and tapes the head of his babysitter onto the bodies of these centerfolds. And when, uh, and by the way, there's an ongoing joke constantly where he's referred to as a masturbator. Um, pretty much every single time we see his character, Sandler makes that joke. Um, but here's the problem, is when Barrymore first finds that picture of the babysitter's head on the centerfold's body, I think we're supposed to assume she's disgusted. But honestly, the way she grabbed it, and her first instinct was to rip it up into little pieces, that seemed like a misplaced rage. <laughs> the relationship between Drew Barrymore's character and this kid is really fucking off. <laughs> yeah. And the movie never addresses this except for comedy. And then at the very end, they hint that he might be gay. I don't know what that was going for, but... I don't know, that's what this character is. Um, so, you know, whatever. There is another subplot where, um, the other kid is in Little League Baseball, and he can't hit the ball worth a shit, and whenever he can't, he, Rob Moran shows up in this scene, um, and when he gets mad, he just throws a tantrum. Never before in my entire life would I have guessed there was a scene where Sandler teaches him how to hit the ball, and he hits it really well. Nor did I ever expect there'd be a scene where that pays off, where he goes back to the Little League game and hits it out of the park. Never, ever would have seen that shit coming. That really surprised me, man. I couldn't believe it. And, as if the kids aren't creepy enough, there's another joke that just goes over and over and over again that was never funny to begin with, but for some reason they just keep using it. Um, Sandler's youngest daughter... Uh, talks in a demon voice sometimes. We have no idea why. We have no idea where the origin of this is or what kind of phase it is. It just exists. Uh, and still exists when the movie ends. Unlike, uh, there is another subplot with Sandler's other daughter where um, she basically doesn't want to let... This is where they, you know, get... This is Sandler's version of Heavy. <laughs> Um, the daughter doesn't want to let the mom go, so she pretends that she's still there. Like, she saves a bed for her, so Sandler has to share a bed with the youngest daughter. And she has a place for her at the dinner table, and everybody calls her weird. And yeah, there's another character played by Kevin Neal, and just doing his... He's the husband of a young wife. You can see all those jokes just from that stuff. Um, and there's another subplot where the reason, uh, Sandler's oldest daughter has to have a scene where she turns beautiful is because she falls in love with this guy who is basically a cross between, I, I was getting Kyle Gallner vibes from him. Yeah. Um, they make a Twilight joke about him, they make a Killian Murphy joke about him. Oh, is that the one? He called him Scarecrow, I assume that means you look like Killian Murphy. I'm gonna give Sandler credit for that, even though I'm not sure that's what he was going for. We're the ones that laughed at that. He may have just been referring to him as a Scarecrow in general, <clears throat> but... The kid kinda looked like Killian Murphy, so that's how I took it. <laughs> Works for me. Um... And yes, that, and he's a joke that's just used over and over again. So yes, this movie is two hours, well no, 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 hold on, hold on. It's an hour and a half of the same few jokes over and over and over again, as well as Adam Sandler's Africa Vacation. That's what this movie is. Starring Terry Crews. Yeah, Terry Crews basically plays, um, if you ever, if you remember uh, Jonathan Richman from the uh, Fairly Brothers movies, uh, particularly uh, There's Something About Mary, when he would just randomly show up and do little musical interludes and that told, that tell the story. That's basically what Terry Crews does here. And, like almost always, Single Moms Club notwithstanding, um, 
Terry Crews can always bring something funny to something bad. Yes, so. he can. Good on Terry Crews for being in here <laughs> to save us all. Yes. Um, now, here's the thing. There's a reason I say an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, I guess. If this is a spoiler to you, please don't be in my life ever. <laughs> <clears throat> After they leave Africa, there's another half hour of this movie. We actually reach, to give them credit, we actually reach what could be a fairly decent ending to this movie. Where they go to the spot where, actually, no, we learned the Sandler set it up. Um, and it's this magical looking place, okay? Um... And everything is going well, and basically, after the whole movie doing the <laughs> thing, they basically decided it's time to be together. So, I mean, I knew the run time going in, so I knew we have a half an hour left, so I knew exactly where this scene was going. Uh, but it would have been a really nice ending for them to kiss, um, zoom out on a nice Africa shot at the end. Because everything else had been resolved by this point. Yeah. So we thought. But... Before her lips can touch his, he backs away and says, I can't do this. Need another half an hour of this movie, please. Um, first off, people are wondering what happened to Adam Sandler. When you look at his good movies, like Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore, and to an extent Big Daddy, those movies were only an hour and a half. Yeah. The Wedding Singer is about an hour 40. Because they stopped at an hour and a half, which is just the right time for a movie like this. And this movie could have done the same. It might have saved it a little bit. Because it was... A, I, I'm going to be honest with you here. I'm not just saying this because of how much I hate the last half hour. I'm just saying, for real, when I thought this movie could have been ending at this moment, my mind actually said, maybe this movie isn't as bad as everybody's imagining it to be. I overestimated Adam Sandler. <laughs> Don't know why the fuck I would do such a thing, but I overestimated Adam Sandler. <laughs> wow. They leave Africa and they go back home, and now they're not talking. And I could feel an ulcer forming when Drew Barrymore went back to work and we saw her best friend again. <laughs> and we learned that her and Dig are back together. Yay. That really has nothing to do with anything. That was just kind of a, oh, now Drew Barrymore needs to be happy. So, and you can witness this, I did this on purpose because I wanted you to vouch for me. Okay. I am i don't know why I'm taking so much credit. Any, If you're not a fucking idiot, I'm sure you did this too, but uh, I just like to brag about it, I guess. Um, Sandler finally comes to his senses, and he's like, what was I thinking? Mind you, we haven't seen Drew Barrymore for a little while. She's not off camera going, oh my god, I really wish he was in my life. You know, oh my god, I wish he'd come back to me. We're only seeing Sandler's portion now. And Sandler's like, you know what? What was I thinking? I gotta get her back. And they're like, yeah, you go get her. And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna go get her. He dresses in a nice suit. He gets a bouquet of flowers. He gets in his minivan. He's driving to her house. We're not cutting anything else. We're just watching Sandler. So as he's driving to the house, I turn to you and I say, Joel McHale's gonna answer the door. Yeah, you do. <laughs> he's gonna be Linda and the wedding singer. And we're gonna put Sandler through. Sandler's on the other side of it now. Yes. It's payback. <laughs> Because it was Barrymore before. If that's supposed to be some clever kind of homage, it, when your movie's been on for about an hour and 45 minutes, fucking stop it. Just, I don't care. Just end. <laughs> but no. Sandler walks up to the door, he's got his flowers, he's got his suit, and he's happy, and there he is. There is Joel McHale. And Joel McHale does, it's the exact, I promise you, it's the exact fucking scene from The Wedding Singer. Yeah. We learn, Joel McHale says, yeah, we're working it out, bye. Um, and then we learn, obviously they're not working it out, that was in Joel McHale's mind. And Drew Barrymore does not want to get back together all. He was just at the house watching the kids yep. while she was gone. And that's it. <sighs> so now, once, now she's on the other side, now she's on the Sandler perspective that he was in in The Wedding Singer. And now she's, she obviously, Joel McHale's not going to say, oh, your friend stopped by. She's got to, we got to drag this out even further. Mm -hmm. 
So, as if... Oh, by the way, another one of the big, oh my god, we're soulmates moments as they both drive the same white minivan. So we've been faked out once. It's like, okay, the movie can end now. Let's go. <laughs> she has to go find him. So, she goes outside, and she sees the minivan pulling up. And she gets really excited. You do right then and there, too. It's like, okay, and here it comes. This is gonna, okay, this is how it's gonna end. He's gonna pull up in the minivan, he's gonna get out, he's gonna smile and wave, and she's gonna go, oh my god, I'm so glad you came back. And she's gonna run into his arms, and then the movie's gonna end. Nope. But no, uh, we're not seeing the inside of the van. We're, now we're only seeing Barrymore's perspective. I foresee no fake out coming here either. <laughs> so, the white van that now has tinted windows, by the way, <laughs> yes. pulls up, and the window starts to roll down, and Barrymore gets really happy, and then she's just as pleased as me. <laughs> it's her goddamn best friend who just bought the exact same minivan that the both of them just happened to have. And we have the, oh, now I'm sad face. Yeah. So... And then there's an embarrassing scene where he shows up at the Little League game and happily ever after. They try to stop it one more time where she's like, I don't think I can do this, but then it's, you know, it's just to fake him out on. Getting you back for Africa. And then, and then the movie finally ends, but then there's like after credits shit, but I turned to you and I said, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, it was just them fucking around in Africa some more. I think yeah. that's all it was. Probably more Terry Crews dancing and bullshit like that. I'm sure it was. Uh, not funny anymore because the movie's been over two hours. Sorry, Terry Crews. Um, and there is a lot of uh, cameos and references. Yes. Uh, once again, you know, we have the whole s redoing the end of the wedding singer thing. Um, Alan Covert appears again as 10 Second Tom from 50 First Dates. I don't know what he's doing out of the uh, institution he was in, just running around. He's in the convenience store. He broke I, out. He wanted to buy stuff. Obviously, I think Covert's a producer on all his movies, so yeah. Covert's probably on set, and they're like, hey, man, you should do... He should have been Sammy <laughs> yes. the wedding singer. Um, but no, they chose 10 Seconds On, which... Well, that's the problem, though, is he was a really, really funny character in the 30 Seconds season, 50 First Days, so they thought they were going to cash in on that again. But pff. most of Sandler's diehards now probably don't remember Fifty First Dates. <laughs> um, there's a scene where the kid does the bull dance from Happy Gilmore. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna take a wild stab and say the whole Hooters subplot was um, obviously that the Hooters was a whole thing in Big Daddy too. Mm -hmm. So um, Alexis Arquette is at the very end as George from The Wedding Singer. Um, Kevin Dillon yeah. himself, like just the way he talks, the way he deals with <clears> things, he's very much like he was in Happy Gilmore. Oh, God. But of course, that was one of the only ones they did not reference. So. Oh! Oh, and, um... There you go. If you want to do a reference, another reference to Fifty First Dates, I guess. Um, another one of those heart-string-pulling moments. That's a similar movie. <laughs> Is, um... Obviously, they're treating... I forgot which movie I was in. I almost called her Lucy. Her name's Lauren now. <laughs> um, the kids are treating Drew Barrymore's character like a uh, mother because they don't have one and they love her immediately. So the daughter's like, uh, will you put me to bed? Will you sing to me? And stuff like that. Now, we learned at the beginning of the movie when Sandler's doing his... Yeah, this is my best dramatic work since PTA. That's probably what he's saying in his head. Um... That they used to, their, their mother loved The Wizard of Oz and would sing them over the rainbow. So when she asked Lauren to sing her to sleep, of course Barrymore is going to bow down over the rainbow. At first I thought they were going to like resent her for it, because like, that's her mom's song, fuck you. But no, they, it's it's a whole oh, thing. Um, which of course, you know, that other famous version of Over the Rainbow was... It's always been popular, but it was also made popular by Fifty First Dates in a way. Uh, at the time, anyway. So, um... Okay. Now that I've said all that, I have two, possibly three compliments. If you can believe it. 
Um, first off, uh, the scenes in Half Rogue are surprisingly really well shot. Yeah. Um, and it's it's the actual movie crew too. You can tell because they're actually in the shots. It wasn't just like, hey, we stole this uh, documentary of Africa and kind of put shit around it. <laughs> um, they actually shot a lot of this stuff, and it actually looks really good sometimes. Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, surprisingly, I was concerned about this. Um, obviously, Sandler and Drew Barrymore made really charming couples in The Wedding Singer and Fifty First Dates. That chemistry is still there. Yeah. They're in a shitty movie, but their chemistry is surprisingly still intact. So that kind of makes the movie survivable. And lastly, um, you're, gonna, you're just going to have to take my word for it on here, but um, I can't believe this. I cannot believe it is 2014. I'm, an actu I'm actually kind of about to defend Adam Sandler. But... Um, this movie's really bad, as you can tell by uh, what I've just told you. But I think because he's Adam Sandler in this day and age, I think the hate is going to be a little bit blown out of proportion. I can see that. This movie isn't as bad as you're going to hear that it is. People are going to make it out to be like one of the worst movies of all time. No. This is definitely a step up from his last few movies. I know that's not saying much. And yes, the movie is really bad. But it's not as bad as you're going to hear that it is. So, if you can believe that. Um, so, yeah, still avoid at all costs if you can, but it's not as bad as you're going to hear that it is. If that makes any sense. I can see where you're coming from there. I, I like Bella Thorne in the movie, too, obviously, because I'm a Disney guy, so she was, she was good in her role. Alright, our third movie is, we're going to be about the same time, even though we only have five movies now. Um, it got a limited release last week. I don't know if it's a VOD movie or not. Might be. Um, I would say so. It's called, not to be confused with a comedy that's coming out later, it's called Sex Tape. But it's SX underscore tape. Because, in case you hadn't already figured it out just by that title, or you hadn't heard about it before, uh... We've got ourselves another found footage horror movie. Are you excited? No, not at all. I'm well, not even going to faint excitement you're, anymore. You're not the one that had to watch the fucking thing like I did. You're right, I didn't. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. There's people that still like this shit, so I'll be as nice as I can. We saw how our Paranormal Activity audience reacted. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Here's the thing. I'm not gonna do. I'm okay. I feel like. I feel like I've reviewed this movie so many times. This exact movie. I didn't see this movie before this week, but I feel like I've reviewed it like twenty times. Yeah, I can see that. So I'm gonna make this as simple as possible. I'm gonna try to not spend that much time on it, because okay. Let me tell you the plot. Um, the title actually makes sense because. It's basically about this, the world's sleaziest couple, and they have a video camera that they will not put down, uh, and they decide that they want to make, they're, well, he's, you, it, it starts with him recording her, because he wants to make kind of a documentary type thing because she's an artist, and about her paintings and all that shit. I don't know. Uh, it would be the most boring documentary of all time if it had been fully made. Um... Actually, let me back up a little bit, because the first scene of the movie, because we're really busting the barriers of originality here, it starts in an interrogation room. Didn't we just see that in Devil's Do? Yeah. <laughs> Among many others. The Devil Inside might have started it one of them, but they couldn't have, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I believe a few of them have started in interrogation rooms. This is another one of those. Um, and we see the main girl... And the cops are telling her that everybody's dead. And her boyfriend's dead. Everybody's fucking dead. So we already know how it ends. Yep. <laughs> Fair so, enough. Um, and we immediately see how bad this actress is. Oh, no. Um, and she has her freak out. And then, of course, we cut back. And we see the tape from the beginning. Because he, he does the line, we found the tape. And this is us watching it. <sighs> I feel like you've seen this movie before, haven't you? Yeah. 
You weren't even in the theater when Devil's Due started because you were uh, messing with the projectors. Yeah, you're right, I was. But you still feel like you've seen this beginning, haven't you? I do, actually. Okay. So anyway, um, now that he's once, he's filming her for this artistic whatever thing, um, he gets the idea that they should make a sex tape. So basically what we get for half an hour is a theatrical release POV porn. <laughs> What? Um, only obviously not as explicit. Yeah. Um, so, then, about a half an hour in, we've established character by watching them fuck about ten times. <laughs> Finally, they're driving around, and they're just finding, they're trying to find different places to fuck is what they're doing. They want to make it interesting. So, finally, they find the perfect place. Okay. Um, they're driving around. Once again, the movie's been on for about 20 minutes now. They've wasted that much time just driving around doing nothing. Except fucking. <laughs> and we come across this building that is clearly condemned and looks suspicious as fuck. But it gets them really excited because they're like, oh man, we should go like fucking there. <laughs> Because, I think it's an irony thing, because the reason they want to film themselves doing it in there is because it is a condemned institution where crazy women who got impregnated would go to do illegal abortions. <laughs> Nothing wrong's gonna happen here. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So, they go over to the building. About ten minutes, the movie is 84 minutes. That's an hour and 24 minutes to math buffs like you. Thanks. <laughs> And about ten minutes of this is just them walking around the building with her trying to convince him to go in. Because it's him actually coming to his senses and saying, you know what, I changed my mind. This is shady as fuck. I don't want to go in there. Yeah, no lie. And she's saying, oh, come on, come on, let's do it, let's do it. Uh, this goes on for ten minutes before she finally gets him in there. Maybe fifteen minutes, I don't know. But what actually gets them in there is, um, and keeps them in there is a cop pulls up and sees them go in. So, instead of investigating, probably because he has his senses about him, he, the cop doesn't fully go in, he just opens the door and says, you know, sheriff's the door, is anybody in here? Um, so when he le they basically stay in there to make sure he's gonna leave, so they don't get arrested for trespassing, I guess. Um, so they decide to explore, which is a great idea. They find all the dusty, dirty, broken down hospital shit. They find, like, toys, like a stuffed unicorn. We get a lovely story about how she used to have a stuffed unicorn just like this, and she accidentally set its face on fire. Oh, boy. Okay. That sounds fun. So, anyway, um... Then they get this creepy idea to tie her down with the straps to a table, and they're gonna do a uh, kinky sex tape here, with her strapped down to one of these old hospital used tables. Shit that has, still has blood on it, by the way. Then they know this because they called it out. So he does the thing where, haha, now that I have you tied down, I'm gonna leave. Um, and while he leaves, um, she gets attacked by a ghost and possessed. <laughs> it's one of those, um, even though we're a found footage movie, we don't have score, we're still gonna jump out and scare you with loud noises. Um, it's one of those things where she's just kind of laying there, and it's silent, and then the camera starts to flicker, so it's like, oh no, shit's going down. And then we get, like, raw and something on top of her, and then, you know, she's fine. But she's possessed, basically. This sounds horrible. <sighs> and, basically, that's basically how the movie starts. Um, and then they start to... <laughs> you ready? I know, I'm trying not to do the same complaints over and over again, because like I said, I've reviewed this goddamn movie 20 times already, but one really stands out to me. Because I bring it up every time and it never fails. Ever. <laughs> um, they decide, they're finally doing it on this table, okay? And he's recording it. So, what is the one thing that I say is in every single horror movie, if it's, it's a bad horror movie, and you have no idea what to do to be scary, so you just do this, even though it has no purpose whatsoever, and never comes back. And there's no point to it whatsoever. So many things come to mind. A spontaneous nosebleed. Of course. A spontaneous nosebleed is always the sign of a bad horror movie that has no idea what the fuck it's doing, and wants to throw in something that 
is reminiscent to other movies. Yeah. I'm sure there are better horror movies from the past that have spontaneous, completely superfluous nosebleeds in them, but uh, not in anything lately. It is the telltale sign that this movie is going to suck. Yeah. And this movie did not let it down. <laughs> um, so after that happens, she decides that she wants to leave. So she calls up, I don't know, I don't know who she is now. She's either the possessed person or she's the real girl. I don't know. But anyway, she calls up her friends and she's like, you guys, because their car got towed, I guess because they were in there for like 10 minutes. But, um, so she calls up her friends and she's like, hey, can you come and get us? Um, and her two friends show up, one of which is this fucking guy, I think his name's Bobby, he wears the sleeveless shirts, and he's like always trying to pick fights. <laughs> um, we saw him, he came in to watch X-Men. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's basically always hitting on her, even though his girlfriend's right here beside him, he's always hitting on the main girl of the store. I see this guy a whole lot more than I would like at my job. <laughs> um... And they see the nose bleeding, it's like, hey man, hey man, you been hitting her? Man, hey. And he's always like, you know, protective of her. Yeah. And when this couple enters the story, I won't go any farther in case you actually want to see this for some reason, but um, when this couple comes into the story, how this movie, go the movie was already off to a great start, obviously, but where this movie goes when the couple enters it is so unspeakably stupid and ridiculous. I'm kind of glad to just stop here. Alright. Now, let me talk. Oh, and I will say, I won't give it away or anything, but this movie has a shock ending. It's supposed to be like, you know, like, oh my god, they totally went there. I'm so gonna tell my friends about this. This is gonna become legendary. Um... It probably won't surprise you in the least to know that this shock ending that they've come up with here uh, was something that was pretty much done better in VHS. Oh so, <laughs> man! So um, I love VHS. It's not quite the same thing, but pretty much, and VHS did it better. VHS did everything better except for the sequel. So, um, when the camera's not rolling, I'll tell you what I was. <laughs> Sweet. Um, if you even want to know, I'm curious. So. Let me just mention this. Uh, oh, and to kind of go into the criticism real quick about uh, not filming. Uh, why does the guy keep filming? That is the question of all found footage movies. And pretty much no found footage movies have a legitimate answer. Ever. Even the good ones. <laughs> but, um, we get... <laughs> this is the best explanation they can come up with. I, I, never, I never laugh out loud when I watch comedies. Especially when I'm just watching them by myself yeah. at home, uh, like I was this. Well, there is a line in this movie that made me laugh ridiculously loud, <laughs> and it's the explanation to why he's still recording. I have to hear this because uh, maybe it's maybe it's his character. Maybe it's not supposed to make sense, but just the. The fact that this is what the writers did, if this even had writers. I question it as much as I question writers and blended, but... Yeah. Um, she's starting to get pissed off because he's still filming. This is when they're sitting on the curb waiting for her friends to show up, and her nose is still bleeding. I don't know why. Um, and she looks at the camera, she says, uh, Why are you still fucking filming? I told you. We had this talk that if it came to something like this, you were going to stop... If it came to something, you were going to stop filming. They actually had this script. This is them trying to be original. They were like, we talked about the not filming thing. So we're original now. Uh, you can't call us out on it. Well, his reason for still film. Okay, she's got a nosebleed. And he's got the camera clearly up in her face. And his excuse for still filming her like this. I just want to make sure you're okay. <laughs> I think some cells in my brain just like... Drop dead immediately <laughs> when I heard him say that. <laughs> uh. Okay, you people that defend the found footage genre, could you please explain this to me? In an orderly manner, please. Please calm down your downvotes and your beatings of your monitors and your. Things are expensive. I try to tell you that every single time. <laughs> your found footage rage. 
There's good found footage movies. There's a very small group of good found footage movies, though. This is the greatest genre ever, idiot. I don't know what you're talking about. He clearly just wanted her to make sure she was okay. <laughs> well... Okay. I don't know who that guy was, now, but I don't want to meet him. <laughs> let me just... Okay. Now let me talk about how I really feel about this movie. Because I'm just as tired of reviewing this movie as you are of hearing me criticize the same things about it. When we do, we're a month away from the half year top ten bottom ten video. Yep. Um, this movie will not make my... I mean, if we're talking ratings, yes, I would probably give this the lowest rating you can possibly think of. But this movie is not going to make my worst year, worst of the year list. The reason for that, I mean, yeah, obviously it's one of the worst movies of the year, but in all honesty, it is just so insignificant. There is just absolutely no reason for this movie to even exist. It doesn't even belong on a worst of list, because it is just that worthless. What happens here is they don't, they don't even, even when they try... They're clearly trying to throw a line out there to kind of be self-referential. Because mm -hmm. when you're self... Everybody thinks the clue automatically is if we're self-referential, then it's okay. Um, because Scream did it. Hey. And everything since then. No, I'm saying... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, Scream did it so well and was a success with it, everybody thinks they can use it as an excuse. That's true. If we call out using the cliches, that means it's okay to do it. Um... That's, it's basically just a cheap way to make money doing the same shit. Like, obviously they're already gonna, I mean, even though it was like a really, really tiny release, still, you know, people are gonna see the DVD cover in, well, Redbox or stores or whatever, but, like, stores to buy it, you can't, you know, because video stores don't exist anymore. But anyway, um, you just see a cover on a, a found foot of a that looks like a found footage movie. There's gonna be some impressionable teenage couple that gonna goes oh, that says, "Oh yeah, we're totally watching that." Yeah, um, and of course it's called sex tape, um, and it's got it's got the nudity they're looking for. Yeah, so you basically have the found footage genre. Somebody basically just said, "Well, if we can combine that with a sex tape." There's that's money in the bank right there. Yeah. That is the only reason this movie exists. Yeah. <clears throat> and they pick the worst couple in the world. This, I mean, okay, we spend half an hour doing the character development where we watch them be cute and funny together. Mm. But this this couple is a bunch of pieces of shit. Maybe they're supposed to be. I don't know. But why do the half hour of character build up just to make them look even worse? When we're talking about him not putting the camera down, there is a scene towards the beginning where they're sitting in a coffee shop, and there is a couple next to them, and they're breaking up, and they're getting mad at him because the camera is facing them. This couple is breaking up, and the couple that we're with is filming them and laughing at them. Oh, they're likable. I think we're supposed to think it's funny with them, because they're, you know, they're so groovy, we gotta be so upset when bad shit happens to them later. Now, this is the kind of couple where you kind of welcome that shit. Which, I guess, is the upside to this movie. When we get to that point, when the the cop's little prophecy comes true about the, oh, by the way, everybody's dead. Um, yes. You do kind of like when that happens. <laughs> Um, you don't root for these characters at all. Yes. And and another thing is, is with this half hour of build-up, okay? Like, with them killing ten minutes just trying to get him in the building. That is just wasting time because that is just how little ideas they have. They literally do not know what to do with this movie apart from, oh, it's found footage and has a lot of nudity and sex in it. That's all they had going in. They have no idea how to make it a horror movie. So they just make it this build-up thing for half an hour, and then they throw in ghosts and possession and nosebleeds and brahas. That's it. That's all they could do. It's just like... they're Okay, when the original Friday the 13th was made in 1980, 
they released advertisements that just said Friday the 13th. Because yeah. back then, they didn't even have a script. They just had a title. It's almost like this movie was in the filming stage. Like, at that point in time. They were getting ready to make this movie, and all they knew was, it's going to be found footage, and it's going to have sex and nudity in it. We'll pick it up as we go along. Yeah. And by the way, the whole point of a movie being found footage is to give it authenticity. This movie is crystal fucking clear. This is clear. Is this guy, like, carrying around a fucking movie camera with him? Because, I mean, I know, you know, digital technology, shit like that, but... Even so, um, what is the point? Because the authenticity is not there when it looks like you're watching a regular fucking movie. <laughs> Except it's got the shaky cam and it and the flickers occasionally when some shit's gonna go down. Ugh. Now this movie is just a complete and total waste of time. It was a waste of money. It was a waste to make. It's just a to there is just no reason for this movie to exist. And there's no reason to keep making them, except that... People keep going to see them for some reason. So, you know, I can't even think of a scene where I was like, ooh, that was a little effective. There's just, there's just nothing in this movie that has worth. Not even one frame. That's... I mean, I would love to be a teenager again when sex and nudity was all it took for a movie to be awesome. But, uh, that was, like, almost a decade ago. So, unfortunate. So, maybe, maybe people who are, like, 15 will maybe get some worth out of this. To be like, oh yeah, like, maybe this movie somewhere will be the first time some kid sees a girl naked. <laughs> and that'll be his, that place in his heart forever. That's pretty much the best possible service this movie could provide. <laughs> That's very true. So, but I would say, you know, amongst all the other movies in this genre, much like the rest of them, this movie's just gonna disappear. And it's not gonna be anybody's first anything. It's just gonna be on the shelf with the rest of them and blend in. It'll be like, when you go to like Walmart and you see like those eight packs that have like those killer clown movies in them and shit like that, or when you can buy all that, the pack I have that has all the Hellraiser movies and all the Prophecy movies in it together. It's oh. one pack with all of those. Wow, that's um, like a lot of money. This will end up in one of those with all the other Fat Flinch movies. <laughs> that's all it's destined to be. And it'll be that one, it'll be the one in the pack where the got, everybody forgets it. It'll be like, well, you know, what movie should we watch tonight? Oh, we got another one of those Fat Flinch movies. And you just kind of let it play. And it just has no worth to you at all. Please don't let that be in a pack with VHS 1 and VHS 2. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'm talking more like straight to video stuff. Uh, okay. So, um... Like VHS went to Sundance. Yeah, it did. Both of them. ABC's of Death. That's a better example. Uh, that wasn't fun. Well, a couple of them were, but... So, anyway... Yes. Um... I don't even know how much time I wasted talking about it. Even that was wasted. You could totally skip <laughs> over that review just now and not even see anything. Oh, God. I just lost, like, half an hour of life just now. <laughs> plus the hour and a half it took to watch it. Wow. I think I'm going to kill myself later. <laughs> You're in here first. Oh, no. <laughs> if I'm dead tomorrow, I don't think it was an accident. <laughs> Maybe the creators of Sex Day could be put on trial for it. That would be interesting. And we can get the $15 they made from movie admission. <laughs> and then you could make a movie about how that movie caused the death of me. That would make a whole interesting movie that's totally worth your time. <laughs> then Sex Tape would finally have purpose in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. Wow. This is the musings of a, a gentleman that has slept for three hours. <laughs> okay, so let's move on now. Before any more life is wasted. <laughs> Let's get to something that you actually enjoyed. Because okay. there's only one more left that you enjoyed. Oh my god. How long is this video going to go? Because we didn't even review the right kind of wrong yet. <laughs> you thought Walk of Shame was bad. <sighs> so, our next movie is Rays. Which um, was a really, really tiny release. It was released in New York City <laughs> on January 10th. That's the only theatrical release it got. And it came out on DVD this past Tuesday. Um, 
And it is a grindhouse inspired action horror movie starring Zoe Bill. Which immediately I think is pretty awesome. Yeah. Because I thought she was really great in Death Proof and she's this fantastic stunt person. Putting her in, as the star of action movies, as, you know, without being somebody's stunt double, being her as an actress, I think should happen more often. Um, and this movie is a good start. Um, I think the reaction to this movie is kind of split. Like, some critics are like, oh god, it kind of sucks. And other critics are like, oh, it's alright. Um, I thought this movie was awesome, actually. Um, basically what it is, is it's basically an all-female cast, uh, with the exception of Doug Jones. <laughs> um, what the story is, is basically women are kidnapped and captured and held in cells. And then they are basically made to fight each other to the death using only their bare hands in a small room that is basically a circle of dirt and a giant stone wall. It's like the inside of a well. Sounds awesome. Um, and the reason they're fighting is if they don't, they're, all of their families are being watched, whether it be their daughters or their aunts and uncles or their uh, parents. Um, they're being watched with cameras in their houses and being stalked. And whoever refuses to fight has their family killed, and whoever is killed in a fight has their family killed. So the only person that survives this tournament is going to be the one that saves their family. Uh, and Doug Jones and Cheryl and Finn are the husband and wife that run it. And they basically project it on a screen for a quaint little dinner party. It's, the the, the, the uh, concept and the script are a little cliche, but the movie pulls it off really well. Very Calvin Candy. In a sense. <laughs> oh, you mean like the Mandingo fights? Mixed with the Battle of the Tough Guys from, Rhett, from uh, Noel's Bard. That could be because Zoe Bell is in Django. That could be your Potentially. Own. And this movie is obviously really Tarantino inspired. Not so much Tarantino inspired, but the kind of movies that Tarantino loves and like releases in his, you know, Tarantino Presents parts. Which those movies do, as much as I love Tarantino, he's like one of the greatest directors of all time. Um. Some of the movies that say Quentin Tarantino presents really, really, really fucking suck. Uh, and this looks like it could have been one of them. It doesn't have his name on it, but it looks like one of those. Uh, this is a huge... This is much better than those, I promise. In case you were going to kind of just look at the DVD cover and dismiss it as one of those, it's a lot better than that. Um, and it's got this really sick sense of humor to it, too. Like, um, when they talk about killing the family members, and we show that they mean absolute business because... Doug Jones, Doug Jones has a really soft voice, almost comforting even, despite the insane character he's playing. Uh, Doug Jones is so fucking great in this movie. <laughs> um, and Sherilyn Fenn's also really good and psychotic in it, who you might know from like Two Moon Junction and uh, other softcore <laughs> movies from the 90s. Um, she's, um, she's got more of a librarian look to her now, but that might have just been for the movie, I don't know. I don't know, I haven't seen her for a while before this movie, but um, we're seeing the families and basically how they're being how they're being taken care of after the the fighter dies, and like they do they basically do an obituary for them over the intercom. Like um, there's a really great line by Doug Jones where he says, um, "This fighter is dead, and she was survived by her aunt and uncle. May her aunt and uncle rest in peace." <laughs> um, and then there's one where it's like. Um, she was survived by her family, uh, last seen here, and it's a picture of them being murdered. <laughs> um, and Zoe Bell is fighting for her daughter that she gave up for adoption long ago. Um, and the fighters include um, some recognizable faces. Some of them are like new, and some of them were just like in bit parts of other movies, but some of them are recognizable faces. Clearly somebody who saw Death Proof, because apart from Zoe Bell, we also have Tracy Toms, and Rosario Dawson has a really, really small part as just one of the random fighters. It's basically a cameo. Um, and we also have um, a real... Um, there's a good actress in this that I had never seen before named Bailey Ann Borders, uh, who is good in it. There is... Um, let me talk about Rachel Nichols for a second. And if you don't want anything, it's like if you want to go into this movie totally blind, then you should probably stop here, because this end, this beginning is really, really uh, interesting. Um, Rachel Nichols, who you probably know from a lot of movies, um, she's one of those actresses that I know I've seen her in a lot of movies, and I know her name. 
But I can't really pinpoint many of the movies I've seen her, and she's never really made an impression. But um, the interesting thing about her character here is we start with her. Okay? This is the beginning of the movie. This is before they show the title. Um, if you look at the poster, the poster says Zoe Bell, Rachel Nichols on the cover. They're the above title stars. Okay. The movie begins with Rachel Nichols on a date. She's on a first date with this guy. And they're getting to know each other and the date's going well. And then they're making out. And she says, and we get a little foreshadowing because she says, um, you know you're going to think this is stupid, but when I wanted to grow up, I always wanted to be a kickboxer. So we know that might be useful in her future. Well, um, so she goes to make out the guy and she starts to maybe possibly want to do it, but then she says, no, nah, we'll wait a little bit. But this was a great first date. She goes inside. She calls her best friend. She gets really, you know, excited, like, oh my god, it went so well. She runs a ball bath, she gets in the ball bath and everything is great, her life is perfect. And then she gets tased by a guy in a ski mask and wakes up in this pit with Zoe Bell and Rachel Nichols, who was second over the credit on the poster with Zoe Bell and who we've just gotten to know. The very first scene of the movie, before the title is even shown, is Zoe Bell beating her to death. And we never see her again. <laughs> the person second to Zoe Bell, above the title, on the poster, is dead before they show the title of the movie. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> it's 13 minutes in when they show the title, and the movie is an hour and 25 minutes. <laughs> and, um... The movie is brutal as fuck, as you could probably imagine. These fights can... Obviously, they have to kill them with their bare hands, and they're only in just this little stone circle, but they still can get creative. Like, they're... Apart from just being beaten to death, they, there's, um... There's, you know, snapping their neck against the wall, there's snapping their bones, there's, um... Stomping them to death, there's an eye gouge in the vein of, uh, 28 Days Later. Ooh. Um and really, really gruesome, effective sound effects to go with all of this. It's really, really hard to watch. Um, there's one concerning a face being just scraped against the stone wall. <laughs> it's really, really... Uh, but in that great grindhouse way. That's, this is very much is in the vein of those... It's obviously very grindhouse-inspired, and it definitely fits in with those kind of movies. Um... There's movies that um, influence Tarantino and Rodriguez and the like. Um, and it's really, really fast, too. This, not only is it an hour and 25 minutes, but the movie just flies by. Like, I didn't even realize when it was, like, reaching the end. And we get to, and the very interesting thing that they do is... you <laughs> Critics may disagree with me on this, but I actually kind of felt this way, for real. Um... You would think with this kind of movie that's basically just women beating each other to death for an hour and 25 minutes uh, wouldn't be much for character development. But uh, not only do we get to uh, kind of get good scenes with the awesome characters that Doug Jones and Sherilyn Fenn play, but also um, we actually get to know some of, the, some of the girls like form kind of a bond and a friendship while the others are like this. Like there's one that's kind of the, kind of the, she's the self-made antagonist of the group. Yeah. And obviously this is all going to come down to, um, no matter how much their friendship forms, um, sooner or later one of them is going to have to kill the other. It's like Battle Royale. Basically. So, um, the thing is, is in that short amount of time, the, the, I guess it's because a credit to the actresses too, um, it actually, they actually manage in that short amount of time to make the characters distinguished enough and like sympathetic enough. To where it actually has, it actually feels like it has more to it when the girls we've gotten to know have to fight each other. And you're actually, like, on the edge of your seat wondering which one's going to come out on top of the other. Because you've actually gotten to know them, surprisingly. Because I think any other movie wouldn't really give a shit. Probably <laughs> it, not. Would, it would literally just be an hour and a half of them beating each other to death, and that's it. <clears throat> but they have just enough char characteristic traits to where 
the suspense builds as the characters we've gotten to know are the ones that have to start fighting each other. Because for a while there, they're just fighting faceless people we've se we're seeing for the first time. Like Rosario's character. It's really weird to just see her kind of pop in like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I thought this movie was fucking awesome. I know, I know it might, like, not get the greatest reaction, but, um, that's just what I thought. So... Like I said, it really helps. I, I love seeing, like, Zoe Bell actually in movies as opposed to just being a stunt double. Like, um... Because she obviously had the part in Death Proof where she basically played herself, but then, um... She was in, like, Gamer and Oblivion. But she pretty much had no lines in this movie. She was just there as either to be a background soldier or to die, or both. That scene in Gamer where her head explodes still makes me kind of like, Duh! <laughs> I always yeah. forget that happens. <laughs> <laughs> It's always great when you're not <laughs> expecting it to show up and it just comes up out of nowhere like that. Yes, um, but if you really, really need a reason to watch it, um, Doug, the Doug Jones and Sherilyn Fenn characters are great. You can't complain that they don't have enough to do and they're not in it enough, but I thought they did a, just enough is what they needed. When I saw Doug Jones in the cast list for this movie, I was really hoping that was the kind of part he was going to play. I was really satisfied when it happened. Um, and Sherilyn Fenn also has it. She's kind of like, it seems, it kind of seems like Doug Jones is the one that kind of does all the sinister stuff, and she's kind of on the sidelines just kind of cheering him on. Mm. But then there's a scene where she has to take care of a fighter that's refusing to fight, and that brings out what, that, what all that character is capable of. And the great thing about um, the killing of Rachel Nichols so quickly is it basically means anybody is fair game. Ah. Kind of like um, the approach that Hitchcock took when he killed off Marianne Crane so quickly. Um, it basically means when you see the second credited person on the poster die in the first ten minutes before the title is shown, any fucking one of these characters can die at any moment. <laughs> and that really made that was a really great way to bring us into the movie. So, yeah, I, yeah, like I said, I can understand that this movie doesn't get that great of a reaction because these grindhouse movies tend to go one way or the other. But um, I thought this was wild in a great way. So, yeah, if you can withstand the brutality and the gore, and, uh, which is really present, um, please, you know, by all means, <laughs> um, it was worth it to me. <clears throat> all right. That's the last of the good reviews today. Oh, boy. For this video, anyway. <sighs> there was a movie that came out back in January at the beginning of the year. This movie went to TIFF last year. <laughs> um, and I didn't really hear anything about it. I, I had heard, like, it didn't look very good, but I'd never actually really seen it or heard anything for it. It's got, like, a 12 on Rotten Tomatoes, which I can't believe it's even that high. Um, this movie is called The Right Kind of Wrong. The fucking title already tips you off, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, this is a Sarah Marshall ripoff, in a way, where we start with this guy. This guy's not having a good year. He is Ryan Quant, and I think that's how you say his name. He's the Australian actor I talked about in Knights of Badassdom. He is also in, he's on True Blood, I think. He's on one of those. Um, and he's the star of this. Uh -oh. um, thank you, Peter Dinklage, for moving on from Knights of Badass and giving us X-Men, whereas this guy moves on to bring us this. Okay, so the movie starts, and this guy is married, but they seem really unhappy, and it turns out that his wife has a famous blog um, <clears throat> about how much he sucks. That's what it's, the blog is called, um, like, Why You Suck or something like that. <clears throat> and she just blatantly tells him, like, I write a blog about how much you suck. And this leads to her leaving and them divorcing. That was quick, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'd actually rather watch Jason Segel drop his talent. <laughs> That's how fucking bad it we, is. We did have to see Jackman's <clears throat> bait and tackle today. <laughs> so, <laughs> a shout out to you, Ashley. So, um, we cut to 18 months later, and this guy is doing the fuck my life, all I do is sit on my couch and get high, 
watching my wife on the news because the Why You Suck blog has now turned into a best-selling book. Okay. So now she's famous for talking about how much he sucks and he's miserable. And the plot of this movie is so incomprehensibly... You know what? I'm not even going to throw another word in there. The plot of this movie is so incomprehensible... I feel like I'm going brain dead just preparing to tell you what it is. Oh boy. Because I guarantee you haven't heard of this movie until now. <laughs> uh, you're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> Actually, do yourself a favor and leave now. <laughs> Don't let this movie into your life. <laughs> just, just leave this movie here. Um, I will deal with it for you, it's okay. Um... <sighs> so... This guy steps outside. He's friends with these two kids, this boy and this girl, this brother and this sister, who are the kids of a guy he works with. He just hangs out with them all day when they're not in school. And he's a dishwasher. But for the love of God, that'll be something totally different we talk about in a second. <laughs> right now we're going to talk about how this fucking thing starts and what this plot is. Okay? And by the way, as soon as I tell you this story, um, you're going to know where it goes in your head. And as soon as you figure out where this story is going in your head, you're going to wonder, whoa, how the fuck does this happen? That was my thought, too. This guy steps outside, and across the street is a church, I think, or a building of sorts where you get married, whatever. Um, it didn't really look like a church, but anyway. <laughs> this kid, one of the kids has a football that he's just kind of playing with. Because he can't throw it worth a shit. <laughs> Is he wearing a tuxedo when he's doing it? No, he's not going to the wedding. Darn I, it! I know it's the room, but... I know you do. Uh, they never actually went to a wedding either, remember that? That's true. They just played football in their tuxedos. So... Wow, that must have been what they were thinking about. You know what? The room is better than this movie. Yeah, me. it is. <laughs> the room is awesome. Now listen to this, okay? Uh, the bride is standing outside with a couple of her bridesmaids outside the church there and the guy throws the football and it lands in front of her and she turns around and she picks up the ball and she punts it to where it's totally out of sight it's like when he hits the ball and blended and it's this great big moment this happened fucking twice this week oh god <laughs> no i watched this movie right before we went to see blended that's probably why i ended bl the blended review with it's not that bad probably because i had just watched this <laughs> So, anyway, when he watches this bride in her wedding dress at the church, getting ready to go in and be married, punt this football, he says, we know this because we hear it in his narration. His narration is the voice in his head. We hear it in voiceover. He says, when I saw her do that, I just knew. Never in his life has he seen this girl before. But she's getting ready to walk into the church to get married, and her punting a football is going to drive him to make her change her life decision around by the end of this movie. <laughs> And, let me continue how this movie goes. What is he going to do? He's going to dress up in a cheap suit, and he's going to go over to the wedding. And he's going to sit in the pew with her mom, played by Catherine O'Hara, slumming it. And the wedding ceremony happens. Okay? The wedding ceremony has happened. This woman is married to this guy. This woman, he has never ever seen before two minutes ago is married now and afterwards everybody's talking the groomsmen are doing their speech and doing all that horseplay uh the bride is upstairs by herself for some reason so he takes the opportunity and he goes upstairs and he just starts to hit on her this is his approach to the one, the one that he met two minutes ago, is to walk up to her at her wedding and hit on her, okay? 
So, the groom shows up, and it's a dude he's met before. And naturally, actually I'll go into the groom in a minute. The, this scene ends with her punching him and literally having him thrown out of the church. Now mind you, you already know how this movie ends, okay? There are no fucking spoilers here whatsoever. From the very get-go, you know how this movie ends. So what you say in your head at this point in time is... The movie starts with this girl getting married. It's a girl he's never seen before. He's still trying to get over his wife and her book. He goes over to the wedding, hits on her, and gets punched and thrown out of the church. How does a movie, believably, in an hour and a half, or a lifetime, but in an hour and a half, go from this to them ending up together? <laughs> How does a movie do this? And the question spends the next hour and a half answering it for you, and I'm promising you people, I promise you, you do not want the fucking answer. They provide so many, it is this series of events that you will not believe in the worst way. Not a, you know, a shocking, you know, broad comedy way. Just in a, are you fucking serious, this movie exists way. Let me talk about the groom now. Here's the thing, here's what you have to do. This is this genre's secret weapon. Um, this is why I love Pretty in Pink, because movies like that were smart enough to not do this bullshit. Um, when, you in a, when you're in a movie, and you're hopelessly in love with a girl that's taken, the guy's gotta be a douchebag immediately. Because she's gotta have a reason to not end up with him or stay with him. Pretty in Pink was ingenious by making Andrew, Car Andrew McCarthy a great guy. Yeah. As soon as this guy appears, for the, for starters, I'm really, really shocked this guy wasn't Ken Marino. It was a guy doing a Ken Marino impression. You can already see it, can't you? Yeah. So, what they do is, and I'm almost positive, I am almost fucking positive this guy is putting a voice on. He has that I'm a douchebag villain voice going on. And every second it's like, I'm going to kick that guy's ass. And they know each other from a previous altercation where he uh, keyed the guy's Hummer. And the running joke in the movie is, if you drive a Hummer, you're a douchebag. <clears throat> For starters, Arnold Schwarzenegger wants to beat the shit out of you. And secondly, um, that is the whole movie's foundation. This guy is a douchebag and does not deserve her because he drives a Hummer. That's basically it. I mean, they pile on more things to make him more douchey, like how he just wants to beat the shit out of him constantly, and suddenly, these two groomsmen we saw him horseplaying with, and you're, are your normal, I'm so glad you got married, dude, you know, good luck in life thing, are now suddenly these idiot henchmen from a bad Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. And these guys solely exist so they can beat the shit out of him and tell him, you know, to stay away from her. Now, let's talk about her for a second. Because clearly this girl has got to have it going on for all of this shit to go down because of her. For starters, I have no idea who this actress is. Secondly, we basically, this is one of those movies, I'm sure you've seen many like it, where the girl is not interesting or lovable in any way. She is interesting and lovable because we are constantly told that by the main character. We are never actually shown why she is such an object of desire. Here's the thing, though. This is how easy the movie takes the route, okay? We see her, and this is what they do. Are you ready? She's a tour guide. That's her big thing. She's a tour guide. And this is such a phenomenon that... Okay, the guy obviously knows nothing about her up to this point. Until he's stalking her, does he learn she's a tour guide. There are scenes... I understand. Okay. Let me stop and just do something here real quick. Um, yeah. In real life, there are moments where... There is a girl that you might be in love with. Who's with some douchebag. Uh, who doesn't deserve her. You know this because you know this girl. Okay? 
and you just you just would like to do anything to get her away from this person that is in no way deserving of her. That happens. However, this guy, number one, we've already been through this, he, he doesn't know her at all. The only way he knows anything about her is when he stalks her. Now, you guys out there who can relate to the character in the way of you know a girl who's with somebody that doesn't deserve her. The character in this movie is the kind of guy that literally, this isn't like some example I'm throwing out. There is a scene in this movie where he watches her through her windows. And the movie plays it off as quirky and charming. There are a lot of things in a lot of movies that are creepy as fuck that have been played off as quirky and charming. And somehow some of them pull it off. I am not sure how anybody ever could pull off watching somebody through their windows <laughs> as quirky or charming. <laughs> but this movie tries its hardest. <clears throat> so he continues to stalk her, and he goes on one of her tours, okay? And another way we're treated to her wonder is, this is just a tour of the land. It's really not that big a deal. It's just a girl doing her job. But he turns to his friend. Here's another whole other thing here I have to go into in a minute. He has a best friend that's played by Will Sasso. Of Mad TV fame. Yeah, this is the kind of movie right? He was also curly in that underrated Three Stooges movie from the Fairy Brothers. That's right, I said underrated. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so... <sighs> okay. Basically, he's trying to convince Will Sasso, I'll be also the audience, about what makes this girl so great and why love at first sight is real. Well, this is the best explanation we get. This is what they do, and he does this over and over and over again. It's the same explanation. This is the only real, if you want to know, if you want to know the secret to love at first sight, this is the best this movie's gonna tell you. I have a whole tirade about how Love at First Sight is a load of shit. I don't know if I'm gonna go into it or not. I might by accident in a second. But here's the thing. The same word he keeps using is interesting. That's the only way he describes her through the whole movie. When, we're, when he's on her tour guide and he's watching her give this tour, this is his response. Oh my god, not only is she beautiful, she's interesting. He says it that way too with all the emphasis. He's just, he's trying, it's like he's trying so hard to grasp onto something of why this is logical. <laughs> and that's what the movie has to give us. She's interesting because she's a tour guide. That's what makes all this worthwhile. That is the secret. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? I should go on more tours. Maybe then I'll actually fall in love with more than one person. No, I've been on a lot of tours. I shouldn't have said that on camera. Doesn't happen. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm shutting up on this there review. Is a, <laughs> there is a side character, played by Will Sasso, which I just mentioned. Yeah. He has a whole other plot going on. <laughs> I don't know why. But it's a couple of things, okay? There are two jokes. And number one... Okay. Number one, it's a very simple plot of he thinks his wife's cheating on him. And it's one of the groomsmen from the wedding go figure. Because, you know, they didn't want to waste any money hiring more actors on this. <laughs> um, just like they didn't want to hire any, you know, good screenwriters. But, uh, and it basically kind of steals that plot from Jeff Who Lives at Home, that little side plot, where they basically uh, spot, they spy on her while she's at her art gallery. Yeah. And they watch her from, like, the truck. <clears throat> the other plot with Lil Sasso's character that is a theme through the whole movie is... And even if you think this is funny, even if it sounds funny, I promise you, it's not as funny as it might even kind of sound. The running joke through the whole movie is that Will Sasso's character's balls have a Twitter account. And he posts little tweets from his balls. <clears throat> his wife made it. It was like a joke between them. They used that joke through the whole movie. <clears throat> So much so that it's its own subplot. How does that make you feel? That I, this movie got made. 
<laughs> That's making my head hurt. Okay. So, now, let's continue. Um... Uh, generally, I respect movies enough, even the bad ones, because even, even in a world where movies like this can be made, all power to you if you can write a script, get actors and a production company and get it made and distributed. It means you did something right. Well, not necessarily, but you did something to get the movie out there. Um, which takes work even if, you know, your screenwriter didn't do jack shit. But, so, with that respect, I do my absolute best to just watch movies from start to finish. Because that's what you do. I've never quit in the middle of a movie. I didn't quit in the middle of this movie. I saw all of this movie. However, there were a couple of times... <clears throat> Let's say when you go to the movie theater and you have to go to the bathroom, um, you just have to get up and hope you don't miss anything, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of the way I treated this movie, even though I was watching it at home. This also came out on DVD this past Tuesday, uh, with Ray's. Um, there were times where if I had, like, another task to do, like in the house, somewhere else, um... I would just get up and do it, and I'd kind of just let the movie go. Because it's no different than, say, you know, going to the bathroom at the movie theater. Because you just go for, like, a minute, and then you're back. That's it. Um, for guys, it's that quick, anyway. There's an app that actually... 30 seconds, even. Well, there's an app now that tells you what you missed when you go to the bathroom in movies That's now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Basically, to keep from losing my fucking mind. Every now and then, I'd just be like, well, maybe I should go do that. I'll just kind of leave the movie here. I can still hear it. I can still hear it. I'll just, I'm just going to get up for a little bit. I, just a little bit, you know. A reprieve of what's going on. But, however, to take a little bit of credit away from myself, I watched the whole movie, I promise. Um, <laughs> okay. And there's another subplot in this movie. Where he's a dishwasher. Not only is he a dishwasher, he is the best dishwasher in the entire world. There are scenes of him where he walks into the kitchen and he juggles plate these very CG plates that are clearly not there, and he juggles cups. And he can just do all this shit. I don't know why a dishwasher would need to do that. He just does it because he's impressive. What's this cocktail? I fucking wishes, and I fucking hate cocktail. I know you do. Um, okay. I like, I mean, looking back on it, I was, you know, just out of my head, but looking back on it now, I can laugh. And this was just yesterday. <laughs> um, okay, so, he does the thing where he can juggle all the plates. He juggles a shitload of plates, and he can juggle cups, and he can wash dishes at rapid speed. That's his thing. By the way, that's also what makes them soulmates. It's because he says, you know, I don't have to, you know, go on. He does this whole speech about how um, washing dishes is the best job you can have because it's instant gratification. Or something like that. <laughs> he actually wrote a book, but that's not important in the plot till later. And it's even worthless when they bring it up again, but whatever. Anyway, he's talking to his friend, and he's trying to figure out a way to impress her so he can win her heart. <laughs> and he's like... He's in the kitchen with his friend, the friend with the kids, and he says, what can I do to impress her? What can I possibly do to get her attention? <clears throat> and an idea hits him, and he suddenly realizes what he can do. And there's a scene where he, f and when he reaches this epiphany, to show, oh my god, I got it, I know what I can show her. He flips up a plate and catches it on his forearm, and he looks at the guy as if to say, This is my big idea. When he threw that plate in the air, and he caught it on his forearm like that, and said, This is my idea, I hit stop. <laughs> I stopped the movie and had to take an actual break. 
because I knew this break was going to make me miss something if I just walked away from the movie. I had to hit stop and just take a breather. I looked at the clock. 32 minutes in. Oh, wow. 32 minutes into this movie. I had to stop it before I walked away from it completely. <laughs> That's believable. The plate on the arm almost fucking did me in for the first time in history. I have seen over 7,000 movies in my life. That's a shoot number, by the way. And never once have I stopped a movie and never gone back. Wow. That close. <laughs> That's... That half an power. hour, half an hour in. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So, there's another way that he needs to win her over. Um, there's another plot where... Okay. Um, it happens twice to him. Uh, he's afraid of heights. This isn't going to be a plot point at all. <laughs> no, not at all. He's afraid of heights. So, his wife makes fun of him for it in the book and on the blog. And then they're on the tour, and the girl's trying to figure out a way to get rid of him. She's read the book, she's read the blog. So she's going to use this against him. And she wants to basically get him away from the tour. She never calls the cops once. When he shows up everywhere, she just looks at him and then lets it go. <laughs> so finally she's going to get him off the tour by saying, you know what, we're going to change the tour today. We're going to go up this mountain and look at the view. And of course they leave him behind. And she says, oh, I forgot, you're afraid of heights. And she looks at the tour and says, kind of pathetic, isn't it? And they all laugh at him and then they all go on without him. Number one... We millions of people in the world with vertigo thank you for that. Yeah. And number two, um, actually that's also my point. How many people in the world have vertigo? That so many, that everybody on that tour thought it was funny to make fun of a guy that's afraid of heights. You don't make fun of people what? like that. What goddamn universe is this movie in? These are hateful people that need to have bad things happen to them. <clears throat> And creepers. Yeah, no lie. <laughs> Not even use that terminology. Oh my god. So, anyway, and then there's a and then there's the whole plot where the groomsmen and the groom try to basically, you know, they're either trying to beat him up or they try to they try to get him arrested because he grows pot. That doesn't even go anywhere. Um, there was there's a scene where the cops show up at his door and they say, "Hey, we heard you have drugs here." I don't even remember where that scene went. I watched the goddamn thing yesterday. I don't... Nothing. I don't remember at all. <laughs> okay. So... This is basically what this movie is. Now... <clears throat> um... We also have that scene where the movie has been on forever. And then finally... It looks like things are going the right way. Like, honestly, suddenly just, suddenly they start making her, okay. For like an hour of the movie, she's head over heels in love with the groom. We don't know why. We don't know, okay, we're supposed to say, oh my god, what does she see in him? I'm on both sides. I don't know what she sees in him. I don't know what the fuck he sees in her either. But they're, in, he, they're, I don't know what his deal is, but she is in love. I don't know, he's just a caricature of, oh, I am the villain, so we don't really know if he loves her or not. But all we know is he's a douche and doesn't deserve her because he's a douche and drives a Hummer. We have no idea how he really feels about her. We were never told, but anyway, um, suddenly there's just a U-turn in the middle of the movie, and she's all, you know what, I'm on the other side of the road now. Um, you're kind of not all that. Just like that. The character has not changed. She's just suddenly sick of him because the script needed that to happen this late in the movie. But then we drag it on. There's the scene where she finally, they get drunk and they do it. And it's like, oh, he actually got her. They're actually together now. And then she's like, no, I was just drunk. I'm not really gonna do this. So now she is getting a divorce from the guy and she's leaving, she's not even with him. She says, 
what, what's that fucking line she says? Um, I left him because of you, not for you. Whatever, I think he even says in the movie, what the fuck does that even mean? But, uh, no, she says, I was drunk, we're not doing this, and leaves. But there's still about ten minutes of the movie left, so you know she's coming back. <laughs> and somehow, some way, we got from that point in the movie to where he got thrown out of the church and punched to they end up together. The last scene of the movie is them doing it in front of a Boy Scout troop. Charming, isn't it? It's worth noting how depressing this is because the guy that directed this movie is the director of Christmas Vacation, which is one of the funniest movies ever made. And he also did Benny and June, which is a really quirky, charming love story. Benny and June is wonderful. <laughs> um, I don't know what the fuck happened to this guy, but um, there is no sign of either one of those movies in this at all. So, yeah. Um, that's what basically what this movie is, from top to bottom. So, you have been warned, and... It comes down to the tagline at the end of the video. <laughs> okay, so, that is it. Okay, <clears throat> if you're still with us, thank you. <laughs> wow, I don't think we're going to get any more uh, venomous than that. Not for a long time. Uh, real quick, a uh, recap, as always. Hexman Days of Future Past? Yes, definitely. Blended? No. Sex tape? <laughs> what? Which movie is that? <laughs> Rays? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you really want to say anything more about this movie? <laughs> All right, join us tomorrow. Spoiler alert, X-Men Days of Future Past. This Sunday, we've got a versus. We're going to go into some dirty cops. Yeah. So. Parting words? Uh, no. no.